You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast, my collection of fascinating true stories from the flip side of history. My name is Steve Silverman, and today's story is titled Grady the Cow. Now, at this point, I would normally give you the question of the day, but I'm going to take a slight detour for this podcast. And let me start by telling you about a special offer that's happening in the coming week. Now, this is totally free. It's not going to cost you anything. Nada. It turns out from July 9th, that's Saturday, to the following Saturday, which is July 16th of 2011, my publisher, Andrews McMeal, is giving away the Kindle version of my first book, that's Einstein's Refrigerator, for free. It's totally free. It won't cost you anything. And of course, my first reaction is I don't have a Kindle. And that's when I found out that Amazon has software for whatever platform you're using. I checked, and uh, there's a list here. Uh, you can get it for the iPad, the iPhone, the Mac, the Windows PC, the an- any Android device, Windows Phone 7, and, of course, the BlackBerry. So if you have any of those, you can get the software for free. You download it by going to Amazon.com. Uh, you know, Choose Kindle. Uh, choose your choice of the software. Install it. And, of course, then all you need to do is search for Einstein's Refrigerator, and you'll have my book for free. Anyway, of course, if you're listening after those dates, in other words, after July 16th of 2011, well, then the deal is over. I can't do anything about it. This I had nothing to do with this. This was the publisher's idea. Okay, so now that I have my little promo out of the way, let's get to today's question of the day. And since today's story has to do with cows, I figured to ask you a little something about cows. Actually, make that a big something about cows. My question for you is, how many years did the oldest cow live to? That's according to the Guinness Book of World Records, I should say. Was it 122 years, 234 years, 348 years, or 462 years? Again, how many years did the oldest cow live for? Was it 122 years, 234 years, 348 years, or 462 years? And as always, I'll let you ponder over this question until the end of this podcast. And now for today's story on Grady the Cow, which started on Tuesday, February 22nd of 1949 in Yukon, Oklahoma. I bet you thought it was going to somewhere, say somewhere else. Yukon, Oklahoma. Now, this day started out like any other day on a 1,280-acre ranch that was owned by Bill and Charles Mock, uh, but it quickly took a turn for the worse. It seems that their 1,400 pound, that's about uh, 635 kilograms, their purebred Hereford cow named Grady was in labor and some complications arose. So they did the natural thing. They contacted the local veterinarian who was Dr. D.L. Crump. I never did find out what the DL stood for. Anyway, Dr. Crump was immediately called into action and he tied Grady to a post and proceeded with the delivery. Sadly, the calf was stillborn. And when it was all done, the vet untied the patient and she just let loose. Grady headed right for her owner, Bill Mock, but he quickly jumped out of the way to safety. Her horn did grab hold of his shirt and, you know, tore a hole in it, but he was unhurt. But there was one really big problem. That is, Grady had somehow mysteriously disappeared. She vaporized. So the two men took a quick look around and realized there was only one place for her to go. That big, gigantic mammal had somehow forced her way through a tiny door in the barn silo. And when I say tiny, I mean tiny, at least for a cow. The opening was a mere 17 inches by 25 and a half inches. For those of you who use the metric system, uh, that's 43 by 65 centimeters, which is just a bit larger than a page, say, from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. It's hard to imagine any cow getting through such a small opening. I can just imagine look on their faces when they realize where she was. Naturally, they looked into the silo, and Grady seemed just fine, as if nothing had happened. But now she was confined to a concrete cell that was only about twice her length in diameter. So the big question is, she got in there, how are they going to get her out? And that's where the media enters the picture. The editor of the local Yukon Sun newspaper heard the story, but he didn't believe it at first. So he went out to the farm to investigate. 
And once he confirmed that Grady really was stuck in a silo, the story was picked up by the wire services and appeared in newspapers all over the world. One picture showed Grady peering out through the door opening, while another was taken from above with an excellent view down the silo column. Phone calls, telegrams, and letters with suggestions on how to get the cow out started to pour in from around the country. For example, the Bangor Daily Commercial held a contest for people to submit their ideas for getting Grady out. The Toledo Times appointed someone to be the cow editor. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Uh, and, of course, forward ideas onto the mocks. Bill Mock later stated that he received hundreds of different suggestions from 44 or 45 states, which is not too shabby if you consider that there were only 48 states at the time. The most common suggestion was to simply make the door opening larger, um, but the frame of its steel door was anchored into the concrete blocks. Also, there was concern that an enlarged opening would weaken the structure of the silo as a whole and could come crashing down on Grady and the men working inside. Not to mention that Grady probably would have freaked out from the noise of those jackhammers. The Associated Press contacted the manufacturer of the silo, get this name, the Interlocking Cement Stave Silo Company, and their president said that while a layman couldn't do it, their technicians could, in fact, take out a number of the staves and replace them without any damage to the silo. Another alternative was to simply rip the silo down to the ground, um, but the cost to replace it far outweighed the value of the cow, so this idea was quickly shot down. Another option was to lift the cow straight on up and out. Uh, they discussed the possibility of bringing in an oil derrick and setting it up over the silo, but once again the cost to do so was way too high. Then a U.S. Air Force officer suggested the use of an Army helicopter to pull a cow out, uh, and that was certainly doable. You know, we see helicopters today lifting far much heavier things like cooling units up to the rooftops of buildings, so a cow should be no problem. But for some unknown reason, this plan never materialized. As you have probably guessed, there were those that suggested she just stay in there for the rest of her life, you know, confined to that concrete prison. And yes, there were those that thought she should just be butchered right there on the spot. But her owners wanted this cow out of the silo. She was valued at $1,000, which is about 9000 bucks in today's money. So Grady was worth a lot more alive than dead. Oklahoma's then governor, Roy J. Turner, even chimed in with his suggestion, just drug her until she's feeling no pain and push her out right through the opening she came in through. Five days after Grady forced her way through that tiny opening, the vet and her owners gathered, along with a crowd of 40 onlookers, of course, to get her out of there. Ralph Partridge, who was the farm editor from the Denver Post, offered what they considered to be the best solution, and he flew in to offer his assistance. First, a ramp was built from the floor of the silo to its door. Next, Grady, the silo door, and its frame were heavily lubricated with about 10 pounds of axle grease. I guess they didn't have WD-40 back then. Anyway, her forefeet were placed through the door opening and the vet jabbed her with a hefty dose of the sedative, Nembutal. Some men pulled forward with ropes while others pushed from behind with all of their might. A truck with a power winch stood by but proved unnecessary. With what must have been one mighty large heave-ho, uh, Grady re-emerged into the world through the same small door that got her in this mess in the first place. Ah, the sweet smell of freedom. Well, I guess I just never realized that it smelled like cow manure. Okay, bad joke. The vet examined her and everything seemed fine at the time. But it turns out that Grady didn't fare as well as was originally thought. They concluded that, uh, you know, she must have been injured on her way back through that opening. So the patient was placed in a stall and wrapped in horse blankets for warmth. Her diet consisted of a nutritious blend of ground corn and oats, alfalfa hay, and cottonseed cake cubes. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Can't wait to have that for breakfast tomorrow. Anyway, uh, she did recover and made her first uh, public appearance on April 21st at the 89er Day Parade in Oklahoma City. Thousands of people watched her go by, but Grady was uninterested. 
fame also allowed her to breed with the finest of gigolos. Her new boyfriend was the blue ribbon bull named High Tone the 32nd, and he was valued at $5,000. That's five times Grady's worth. And she became a bit of a tourist trap, and people who were traveling along the famed Route 66 highway just had to take a slight detour to go see her. And for many years after her rescue, tourists continued to stop by to see the famous cow in her pen that they built out near the road. Now, if you plan on going to see Grady today, don't bother. Cows just don't live that long. Sadly, Grady the cow passed away on the evening of July 24th, 1961. She was 18 years old and simply died of old age. Uh, During her lifetime, she had given birth to six calves, four female and two male. And you can't even go to see the famous silo because it no longer stands. They tore it down in 2001 to make way for the construction of a regional hospital. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. And now for a few words from our retro sponsor. It's now possible to tell almost exactly what Americans think on almost any given subject. An independent research organization recently conducted a poll in an eastern city to find out what kind of containers housewives prefer for foods. An overwhelming majority said that they preferred glass containers, and most of them mentioned these four reasons. Glass lets you see exactly what you buy before you buy it. Glass containers are clean and sanitary. They don't affect flavor or purity. Glass containers are easier and safer to open and can safely be used to store leftovers. Now, in the same survey, eight out of nine mothers of young babies said they preferred prepared baby foods packed in glass. Most of your favorite food products and all of the better brands of prepared baby foods are now available in anchor glass containers, protected by tamper-proof anchor vacuum caps. Both products of Anchor Hawking. A great name in glass. That commercial is from the January 16th, 1947 broadcast of the CBS show Casey Crime Photographer. This particular episode was titled The Surprising Corpse. Anyway, uh, the company name comes from the location of their original glass factory. It was located near the Hocking River, which is a tributary to the Ohio River. The company developed one of the first glass stamping machines, which allowed it to crank out up to 90 pieces of glass per minute. This cost-cutting efficiency allowed Hocking Glass to survive the Great Depression while most of its competitors went belly up. So that explains half of the Anchor Hocking name. One would tend to guess that the anchor portion had something to do with, say, you know, dropping an anchor into the Hocking River, but there's absolutely no truth to that. It turns out that Hocking Glass merged with the Anchor Cap and Closure Corporation on December, th- on December 31st of 1937. Hocking made the glass jars, and Anchor made the lids to top them off. It was the perfect marriage of two companies. And now for a few totally useless, yet totally true tidbits from history. It's time for what I like to call News of the Weird Past. And the tidbits that I've chose to tell you this time all involve the theme of dating and matrimony, although I don't suggest you try any of these, no matter how desperate you may be. And our first story is dated December 22, 1913, which reported that a 30-year-old Yonkers, New York bachelor named Ralph Herman took an ad in the local newspaper seeking a, get this, he was seeking a homely wife. And to my amazement, he received about 25 replies. One in particular was from a woman named Rose Bachman, who seemed to offer Ralph exactly what he was looking for. Rose included a photograph and wrote, quote, I am 29 years of age, and from the enclosed, you can imagine that my homeliness is incomparable. And that's the end of the quote. Uh, she added that her father had left her a fortune and had previously only been sought after by men for her wealth. Ralph decided that he wanted a homely wife because he felt that she would be more domestic in taste and will not, quote, be crazy about society. And that's the end of the quote. 
Our next story is from the December 15, 1955 issue of the Michigan Daily, where it's reported that two mineralogists named Ed Poindexter and Joe Matarino came up with a great new way to get the attention of girls on campus. You see, they rigged up a box that contained a red light bulb, and the word high was cut out in the front. They then placed that box up in the window of their laboratory, and every time a cute co-ed walked by, they simply pushed the button to illuminate the sign. They claimed that most girls smiled and waved back, but uh, I'm not sure if they ever got a real date or, you know, did they even get a girl to talk to them? But it was a clever idea. Uh, Now, years ago, my best friend Jamie told me the ideal way to meet women. She said all you need is a Pez dispenser filled with candy. You just walk up to anyone and offer them a Pez. Jamie explained that it was the ultimate icebreaker. Even if they don't want the candy, they will still smile, and you can just start a conversation from there. I have to tell you, I didn't meet my wife that way, Uh, but I did give one of my students a Pez dispenser earlier this year to try on a guy that she likes, but she was, you know, just too afraid to talk to. She ran out of my room all excited, and believe it or not, they dated for a couple of months, although it didn't work out in the end. And our last tidbit is from December 26th of 1956, which reported that Salvador La Roca was in court on a charge of assault against his 32-year-old Spanish mail-order bride who was named Adelaide. They had married just four months prior. Now, her husband claimed that he was 41 years old, but he was really 64. He also claimed that he was a man of means and owned a home, neither of which were true. Uh, Talk about false advertising. Anyway, the court ruled in Adelaide's favor and ordered Salvador to pay her return passage home to Spain. And now for the answer to today's question of the day. And I'd ask you how old was the oldest cow when she died? And I give you four choices. Was it 122 years, 234 years, 348 years, or 462 years? And I was really surprised by this answer. The answer is choice number three, 48 years. That record is held by Big Bertha, who was born on St. Patrick's Day. That's March 17th of 1944 in Ireland. Talk about the luck of the Irish. Uh, she died on New Year's Eve of 1993, just three months you know, shy of her 49th birthday. Now, considering that the average age of a cow in captivity is seven years and 15 in the wild, that is quite the record. Um, I guess is the diff- the great difference there is due to slaughtering. Anyway, uh, she also holds the record for the greatest number of calves at 39. Can you imagine having 39 kids? Anyway, I should mention the Guinness Book dropped both the oldest cow and the greatest number of calves produced in 2006. So there is a, you know, a slight possibility that this record may have been broken. Now, attaining this world record in the last few years of life made her, you know, kind of a bit of a celebrity. Uh, through her appearances at cattle shows and parades, Big Bertha was able to raise an estimated $75,000 for various charities. Now, the noisy crowds at the parades made her a bit jumpy, so her owner gave her a dose of whiskey, uh, you know, which was aimed to calm her down before each event. And upon her death, a large crowd turned out for a wake that was held in her honor. And then she was taken to a taxidermist and, of course, stuffed. And if you're curious, you can see her on display at the Hazel Fort Farm in Beaufort, uh, County Kerry. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's story on Grady the Cow, as well as our question of the day on Big Bertha and how long she lived, listening to our retro sponsor, uh, Anchor Hawking Glass, and, of course, the news of the weird past tidbits on my favorite, which is the ad for the homely wife, the mineralogist who used a sign to get the attention of coeds, and the return to send their mail order bride. If you'd like to read more true stories just like these, uh, please be sure to get a copy of one of my books. They are Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart, and both are written by me, Steve Silverman. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, Einstein's Refrigerator is available for free from Saturday, July 9th through Saturday, July 16th, 2011 in the Kindle format. All you have to do is go to Amazon.com and download the Kindle version. And as I had mentioned earlier, you don't need a Kindle to do so. They, you know, they seem to have an app for nearly all of the major operating systems out there. 
And I'll be honest, I'm not sure why they're doing this. It kind of, you know, came up out of the blue. Um, but I'm guessing it's to generate, uh, you know, some more interest, you know, to push it up in the rankings for a book that's been out for, you know, it's been out about 10 years. And it's been a pretty steady seller from what I understand. Um, no, whatever the reason is of why they're doing this, I'd appreciate it if you can download a copy. Even if you purchase a copy, just download another copy and, uh, you know, maybe that'll make the numbers go up a little bit higher. And if you can tell other people you know to download it, hey, it's free, you know. It may not be their taste, you know, not everybody has the same interests in life. But if they just download it and if they don't like it, they can just delete it. Uh, you know, go on Facebook, email your friends, whatever, go to, you know, any user group you're part of, tell them to download the book. Uh, you know, word could spread and there could be some interest and who knows, maybe uh, they'll want me to write a new volume. You never know where it will lead. Anyway, uh, as always, there'll be additional resources, including scans of the original research documents of this podcast, some other comments I have, and so on, on my Facebook page, which is at www.facebook.com slash useless information podcast. That's one word, facebook.com slash useless information podcast. And as always, if you want to email me, you can do so at useless at steve.silverman.name. That's useless at steve.silverman.name. Uh, there's also a link on the Facebook page to do so. Well, anyway, thanks for listening. And if you do download, download the book, thanks for doing that also. Take care, and I hope you tune in the next time. Bye.